Pal, who was uh, David's first wife, hello Pat, and uh, explain why, she, why she's here and then ask the question, why did the people who put together the text um, place this story um, it, it, where, it is, where it is and where we find it in the, in the Bible? Uh, but before we do that, I, I want to just give an example because of something else, because the text has, is full of mysteries. And if you can unravel the text and put it, and put, and put it together within a different context, we learn a lot of different things. For, for example, I just want to just you know, take a step back and think about Passover. We always talk about Elijah. So many of you might be familiar with the story. Chuck, you froze. No audio. We have enough. Chuck, your bandwidth uh, must have gotten crowded or something because you your, your image and sound froze. Okay. Text him. Try the chat. I'll text him and I already chatted him. You froze. Chuck, you froze. The sound and video are lost. I think uh, there's something wrong with your bandwidth, period. That's not something I can control, period. You can see him online, actually. I think he's probably trying to sign back in. Yeah, yeah he's not online at all. Sometimes it might be better to call in to speak and then just have the video for the the, the facial. Okay. Yeah, you you look. You lost on your end. Yeah. Do you want to you want to want to call it instead? Okay. Do you have the uh, call in number? It should be on. It should be on the notice I sent out to everybody, including you. Okay. Let me see if I can find it for you. Sure. You got it. Okay. Right. Okay. You need the, uh, you need that, uh, what do you call it? Uh, okay. He's calling in. He's going to call in, folks. Great. Yeah. In the book of Kings, we have this wonderful story about Elijah and fighting the prophets of Baal, where he's a real trial and they have this, he tests them and everything else. And eventually he, a flames come and, and all the prophets of Baal are destroyed. And as a result of that, Elijah in the ninth century goes into um, exile. He's fleeing from the king Ahaz 
who pursues him with his soldiers all around the country. And um, he doesn't have a place to stay. He uh, doesn't have food. He gets depressed. He goes up to Mount Horeb and he, he has this contact with God. Well, the, the, our, the, the people who put the text together were very serious about this. They had a special point to, to prove. However, if we look at this from a larger point of view, we realize that Ahaz, the king in the ninth century BCE, wanted to increase international commerce. After all, it was a time between Persia and between Egypt, they were weak, and this was his time to really do it. And he invited the dignitaries from all the other countries to come in to establish trade. And one of the ways which one established trade is by allowing them to worship the way they wish to worship. Everybody else accepted all the other gods, but for some reason, Elijah the zealot refused and only wanted one kind of one form of worship the way he understood it. And so what essentially what Elijah did is he ruined the international commerce for the country of Israel. And we don't really think about that when we look at, when we look at the text. Having said that, I'd like to now shift to, to Michal because last week, for those of us who were able to go to shul where there was a Haftorah, we read at the end of the story of King David about Michal. Here we have David, the king, carrying the Ark of the Covenant back into Jerusalem, dancing and singing and doing all these wonderful, wonderful things. And then we see Michal looking at him and, with, with scorn and saying terrible things. And David reacts by saying, I'm going to lock you up in the tower and you're never going to be seen again. And so the, the question is, why would Michal do this? And the other question is, why would the authors of our text place this story in the, in, in the text and in our Haftarot? So in order to do that, we have to understand a little bit about who Michal was. So a lot of this is mentioned in the sheet that you have before you. But we can't, well, scroll if down. you can't see it, it can be downloaded later on. Alan Budman will tell you where it can be downloaded. But the bottom line was that Michal was David's first wife. But she wasn't his intended, because we're told that after David slew Goliath, he was promised Saul's firstborn daughter. And Saul said to him, David, here is um, He's lost him again. his firstborn daughter. Uh, but what Saul said, decides to do is marry off his firstborn daughter to somebody else. And then he says to David, here is my, my, my daughter, Merab. I will give you to her in marriage. In return, you'll be my warrior and fight the battles of the God, of the Lord. But at that time, Merab should have been given to David, but was given to a man named Adriel, the Meholathid. By betrothing Michal to David, Saul placed an obstacle to David's succession to the throne. Now, so there was already a political issue between David, who was killing thousands while Saul was killing hundreds in their, in their relationship. But what Saul hadn't counted on is that Michal fell in love with David. And when this was reported at first, he was, Saul was pleased. He thought, I'll give her to him and she could snare as a snare for him so then the Philistines can come and arrange to have David killed. Um, unfortunately, as it didn't happen the way because when Saul tried to send assassins to kill David, Michal, who loved him, told him about it and, and was able to enable him to escape. As it says, the night Saul sent messengers to David's home to keep watch on him and to kill him in the morning. But David's wife, Michal, told him, run for your life tonight, you will be killed tomorrow. And she led him down the window and he escaped and he fled. And then Michal takes an idol and she sticks it up and she tries to pretend that David is she covers it up that David is actually there in, in bed. Um, so the rela so with, with Michal seems to be a very, very loving, loving wife. But uh, now let's just step back a second. So when did this actually occur according to the text? Well, David was born around the year 10, uh, 1010 BCE, and he died in, nine, in 970 BCE. So he ruled as a king for for 30 years. This was the event that we are talking about now, happens probably 15 years 
uh, after David slays Goliath. So what happened in between? Well, Saul was, was, was jealous of David and David fled as an outlaw for many years. And while he did that, he um, assembled a band of merry men, the only other military force in the country at that time. And he hired himself out um, as a mercenary, sometimes to Philistines, sometimes he protected the local villagers, but his reputation grew and grew. And Saul became more and more uh, frantic um, because of, and chasing, began to chase David around the country, trying to kill him. Uh, at one point though, the Philistines, um, who were a constant threat because after all we had taken their land, uh, came and then a major battle was fought at the town of um, Aphek. And uh, Saul and his son Jonathan were killed. And the Ark of the Covenant was, became Philistine, a Philistine possession. And this was very important because the Ark was one of many different religious totems, objects that was, um, that was held, that was uh, revered by the, local, by the local tribes. Now, the Ark was actually held in um, Shechem, Bethel, and Ritzpah. These are three towns about 15 miles apart, and it would travel every couple of years to different towns, and it was an object of veneration. Uh, when Saul died, he didn't leave a successor. And uh, David at that point, being having the only military at the time, uh, went to the people in, um, in Hebron, which was then the capital of the country, and convinced them to make him king of, let's just say, the south. Saul had one son named Ishbosheth. Apparently, he wasn't the strongest of individuals, but uh, his, his uncle, Abner, who became his general, uh, took Ishbosheth and schlepped him up to the north and proceeded to take him in front of all of the northern tribes, trying to get them to proclaim and to acknowledge Ishbosheth, Saul's son, as king. This was um, worked out relatively well in the beginning, but Ishbosheth was not a leader. And uh, at the, while this was going on, David was trying to establish himself as a king, which meant he, he needed to get rid of all of his rivals, which we'll talk about in the next session we have, which is in a few weeks. So he went, to, he went about eliminating any of Saul's cousins, children, uh, distant relatives, or anybody else who might have been loyal to Saul. And then as he built his, his, his empire up and as he solidified the south, he went to the northern country. He went to, to Abner and Ishbosheth and said, give me back my wife. Now, for those of, who, of us who have read Bible, we know David had many wives. Um, the, the most famous one probably was Bathsheba. But he went and said, give me back my wife. And uh, Ishbosheth said, this was his sister. And his sister now was living with him. And not only was she living with him, she had remarried and had several children with him. And David threatened Ishbosheth and said, if you do not give me back my wife, I am going to rip you apart. I'm going to tear you apart. I'm going to torture you. I'm going to make you wish you had never been alive. And Ishbosheth relinquished his sister, Michal, to David. And David then took her back, because after all, after all, this was Saul's remaining child, took her back with him to the city he had just recently conquered called Jerusalem and established her as one of his, well, one of his wives. Now, some of you might remember there was another Haftarah where uh, David is bringing the, the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. And he, originally he assembles an army and he has musicians and uh, jugglers and, and, and you know, a a actors and they take the Ark and they put it on a, a wonderful cart and they're supposed to take that cart singing and dancing with them to Jerusalem. And allegedly that happened, but then there's this story about how uh, 
an ox must have broken a wheel or stumbled. And uh, Uzzah, who had been taking care of the ark for seven years now, uh, while it's been there, reached out to it and, and he, was, he was killed. He died. Well, it doesn't really make very much sense. What happened was, most likely what happened was, is that the northern tribes who had venerated this ark for almost over a hundred, almost for 200 years, really resented the fact that this king was taking it and trying to centralize worship in Jerusalem. And the idea of this th story in the threshing floor was, uh, was a cover up for an attempted rebellion to take back the ark. Anyway, to move on, David, had to, so David loses tremendous face with this. He has to wait for several months before he can reestablish uh, the credibility to bring the ark to Jerusalem. And finally he does in last week's Haftarah and, and he moves forward and he's singing and he's dancing in the streets. And Michal looks at him from, his, from her tower and she says to him, look at, what does she say to him? She says, look, you're acting like a clown. You know, you're dancing, this is this the way a king should act? And she says all of these um, not very appropriate, appropriate things. And, um, And, Michal re and David responds to her by saying, uh, you are, I'm going to quote this now, I will dance before the Lord and dishonor myself even more. Um, and I will be of low, in, low in my esteem, but among the slave girls that you speak of, I will be honored. And so her, to her dying day, Michal, daughter of Saul, had no children. So the question really comes now is, why did Michal say this when she saw David? He ruined her life. He abandoned her. And then after she had remarried years later and had children, and I forgot to tell you, when he, when Ibshboset gave up Michal, her husband and her children followed them screaming and crying, according to the text, begging for the, the soldiers to give her back, which of course they wouldn't. And so here we find Michal several years later, wanting nothing to do with this man. And, and, and so that's, that's truly the story, and story of, of Michal. But now the question comes, why did the authors of this text place the story of Michal in this text and allow it to be read as part of our prophetic reading? After all, the whole prophetic reading is about David bringing the ark, rejoicing into Jerusalem. The, one of the ways he centralizes the country. It's, and this is what I think. I think the, 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 the people who organized this text several hundred years later did it because they needed to centralize, to, to centralize and to show, well, centralize isn't the word, to legitimize the Davidic role and the centrality of Jerusalem. Why did they do that? because they were living, and we'll talk more about this at our next session, um, they were living, um, the people of Israel, hundreds of miles away, outside of Jerusalem, outside of Israel, and they wanted to reestablish a people so that, that we could return to our promised land. Um, it's a lot of material to do in 15 or 20 minutes, but I know after 15 minutes, you get, you stop, you, things get boring. Any questions? I can make something. <coughs> I'm trying no? oh, okay. the, the chronology, Chuck. Um, yeah. So this, this, I, I always thought that this, this uh, event where David danced into Jerusalem and created like uh, happened before he got into uh, dalliance with Bathsheba and so on. Uh, I, I got the sense that you implied that he had already had several wives. Uh, uh, no, he has Bathsheba later. He, okay. had Abigail, he had Abigail before that. That's right. And then, and then Michal had, uh, she did have children, you said, with, with her brother? No, with, she, had a, with an, she had another husband. Another husband, because we never hear anything about those children, apparently. They're, they're named in the text, mm -hmm. uh, in the book of Samuel, but we never hear anything else about them or about um, her husband who was abandoned in the North. Hmm. 
Now, were the kingdoms also where there, there, were, there was a north and a south? Is that, is that happening in, in this period of time or did that happen? That happened afterwards, right? The, the, the formal division of the north and the south happened after the death of Solomon. Solomon, right. Okay. We had, then we had a northern kingdom and, and a southern kingdom. Staring at the uh, text, Mikhail, for whom I paid the bride price of 100 Philistine foreskins. Can you explain that? Could you speak a little louder? I have trouble hearing you. Uh, according to the text. Oh, I see it. The bride price of 100 Philistine foreskins. That was a bride price? Foreskins? That was, a, that was um, Saul. It's a bride price for, to get to marry his daughter. It wasn't just killing Goliath. It was also... The death, it's, it's symbolic, obviously. It's converting um, them I doubt they, I doubt they circumcised 100 Philistines. So but they converted they, them what they meant was the death of 100 Philistines, or some large number. Well, was it his death, the Philistine death, or was it the, the conversion of the Philistines? No, the conversions, the Philistines did not convert. This was, this was death. This was about one That's tribe right. fighting the other. I think in another culture, you might have been calling it scalps. I was right. thinking the same thing. <laughs> They're Jews, so it's worse than this. Right. Mm. No. Um, okay. Well, um, great. Alan, when do we? When is our next session scheduled? Our next session is next Tuesday. We'll be sending out invitations, of course, so you'll all get notices. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this. I know I did. Yeah, yes, great. very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Don't go that. If, if anybody would like to present, please send me an email. Address it to a budman, a b u d m a n, at f j m c dot org. A budman at f j m c dot org, and we will discuss getting you on. We're happy to have you present. Chuck, I want to thank you. So, excuse me, I'm sorry, Rabbi Simon. Sorry. Uh, thank you for the tremendous job as always. Uh, this is one of a series, and uh, we'll be doing one a week for the next at least four weeks. Uh, I, again, I think it's great. I hope you all loved it, and we look forward to seeing you again very soon so, on Zoom. Alan, if I could answer one thing. So the next, the next session is going to follow up with a little bit more about King David. We're going to look at David and Goliath, the real story. And then mm -hmm. we're going to look at how David managed to, um, why and what happened when he tried to eliminate some of uh, Saul's... Uh, descendants um, and we'll, we'll follow that and there is a, a sheet that should really be up on the website if I that with um, sources. Uh, Rabbi Chuck should we be looking for text to accompany the invite? Um, yes it will be text. It will yeah, be text, the text that's already been written and posted so yeah, just, it's, it's just, there. Just the way we sent this one with, an, with a uh, site to uh, text we'll yeah. have the same thing next week as well. Well, yeah. that was very helpful because many of us have never read the story. And, and right. Well, I wanted to give you this, but I also, you know, it's kind of challenging when you're teaching this way. So sure. I felt rather having the, having the sources available for looking at afterwards and kind of giving you the summary of the story provided the insight that I think is important to have when we study these kind of texts. Yeah. No, it was great. Great. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.